Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining our fall 2019 uh, virtual community conference. Um, my name is uh, my name's Chris, uh, and I am the engagement campaign director for Improved Care Now, and will be your host this evening. Um, and so, uh, thank you, thank you so much for joining. Before before we get started, a uh, couple of a couple of things. One, just to let you know what what we're trying to accomplish here and, and what virtual community conferences are, or how we see them. They're a way to uh, build a community, um, uh, an opportunity to celebrate successes, overcome, find ways to overcome challenges. Uh, this is, these two are key. Uh, finding something concrete that you all can take back uh, and implement, we say implement by next Tuesday, uh, something you can do by next Tuesday, even if it's small. Um, and then we hope to find something, we hope that each person on this call can find something uh, that, that can help, uh, that can help, help you all. Um, we want to increase knowledge and awareness, um, be able to have you all be able to talk about the ways to get involved uh, at the network level. And then here's something that you may be able to implement locally. Um, the agenda for tonight, um, first we're going to hear from Dr. Coletti, um, some, some updates about improved care now. Uh, then we'll hear from, from Maddie, uh, talking a little bit about her experience. We call them Ignite Talks. We'll come back to me. You'll hear from me again, talking about uh, engagement uh, and getting what I need when I need it. Um, hear from the Patient Advisory Council, uh, talking about nutrition, disordered eating, and patient perspectives on IBD. We'll hear from the wonderful team uh, from, from Kansas City, talking about how they built, how they co-produced, how they built their grassroots organization um, there. Uh, and then finally, we'll hear from Jill, who's one of the co-chairs of the Parent Working Group. Uh, and they're gonna talk about their victory, uh, their, their vision for the future and, and outcomes, and then all wrap things up. So with all that said, uh, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to turn over the mic to Dr. Kletty. And, and Dr. Kletty, if you want to just give me a heads up when you want me to move forward, I can advance the slide. Okay, sure, I'll do that. Hi, I'm uh, Dick Coletti at, uh, at the uh, University of Vermont. Um, and I'm happy to be uh, with you this evening. Next slide, please. Uh, Improved Care Now, um, we have 109 centers. We're located in 39 states in the District of Columbia in the US, as well as in England, Belgium, and Doha, Qatar. Next, please. Uh, we have um, 109 centers with 950 pediatric gastroenterologists and 30 uh, IBD patients at those centers, which is a little over half of the IBD patients cared for by pediatric gastroenterologists. Next. And um, Currently, our, our registry, our database has 43,000 patients. Um, uh, many of the, so some of those you can tell have um, moved on to ad adult gastroenterologists. And um, uh, the, the registry has 310,000 visits documented or 120,000 patient years. So we continue to be the largest and fastest uh, growing uh, pediatric IBD registry in the world, and it continue, it's a gold mine of data for learning. Next, please. The uh, centers include uh, some of the best centers in the country, uh, as ranked by U.S. News and World Report, 45 of the top 50 pediatric gastroenterology programs, uh, including nine of the 10 honor roll children's hospitals. But I like to say we also do a Lake Wobegon ranking. Those of you who are fans of Garrison Keillor, uh, a radio show will recall how he talked about Lake Wobegon, where um, all, uh, all the men are good looking, all the women are strong, and all the children are above average. And in Improved Care Now, all the centers are above average because we're doing things to improve care uh, that no other centers are doing. Next, please. Our, um, our culture is that we all teach and we all learn. Uh, 
We steal shamelessly and share seamlessly. We know that um, if you work alone, you can go fast, but to go far, uh, we have to work together and that's what we do. Next, please. Uh, our um, community is, uh, our Improved Care Now is uh, focused on improving outcomes and uh, it's built on community, a community of patients, families, clinicians, other healthcare professionals, researchers, uh, and all of us are working together. Uh, uh, we use um, technology so we can reuse the repurposed data for improvement, clinical care, as well as research. And we uh, continuously strive to learn using our data and uh, improving care. Next, please. Back in uh, 2007, which is when we first started recording data, we were focusing on improving the processes of care. And soon after, um, we began to uh, define outcomes goals and focused on how could we uh, improve um, outcomes uh, using uh, chronic care management techniques. Um, between 2009 and 2015, um, we be introduced research uh, and innovation uh, to our network and peer production, which means that all of us were working together, patients, parents, clinicians, researchers, and our technology got a boost from a large um, uh, grant uh, that enabled us to create an enhanced registries uh, and to s simplify uh, data collection through a method we call data in once. And we began doing uh, comparative uh, effectiveness research. Um, uh, more recently, we have been focusing on scaling up engagement of patients and families. Um, and uh, um, among the centers, we created a uh, node structure or learning labs um, uh, so that small groups could, uh, of centers could continue to work together in a small group manner. And um, we've also um, uh, developed infrastructure for patient-centered research. And this year, 2019, we've been um, setting our goals higher for both impact and outcomes. Next. Um, as I said, we focus on outcomes. Um, we um, are working to build uh, processes and tools and structures um, that enable us to share and collaborate we have these learning labs, we're engaging more stakeholders, more participation means more capacity, which means more uh, resources, more customized resources and more diverse activities. We still uh, wanna get better outcomes and get more uniform uh, excellence throughout the network. Uh, so that all centers in the network are performing as well as the best. And we are, are aiming for more care center diversity um, and uh, continue to strive for uh, new knowledge and um, want to address some uh, of the social disparities in outcomes. Next, please. The uh, one way to think about how to improve uh, the health and care and costs of, uh, of IBD uh, treatment and patients with it is, um, is to use improved science, improvement science, which can boost um, remission rates by about 15%. And next uh, to um, uh, to include patients and um, parents and foster self-management, which we believe can, uh, can boost remission rates 
another 10% and to um, develop better drugs and tests and introduce these uh, to our centers and patients. In the real world, all three of these things are going on at the same time. Uh, and and Improve Care Now as a learning health system is able to work on all these aspects at the same time. Currently, our remission rate, um, <clears throat> uh, this is uh, by remission rate, I mean what percentage of patients are feeling well uh, for, and functioning well and uh, are, according to their clinician's evaluation based on their symptoms and, and tests, about 82% currently um, are, have clinical remission and that's much better than 10 years ago when it was closer to 60%. Next, please. Uh, sustained remission is defined as having an inactive, uh, is having inactive disease and no relapse for at least 12 months. And that uh, most recently was measured at uh, 56%. And you can see how that we've had a su substantial increase in that over the last decade, uh, we still have a ways to go. Next. Um, and to help us um, uh, increase remission rates and increase rates of sustained remission, we have recently introduced um, what we're calling Pathways to Mastery, where each center is focusing on getting to the next stage. The newest centers, which are just learning the foundations or fundamentals uh, of, of improvement science and improved care now are focusing on registering all their patients. Um, the, the, the next group up is focusing on getting their remission rates over 82%. Uh, the next group, which have uh, has achieved uh, registering their patients and more than 82% remission, they're focusing on getting their remission rates greater than 55%. And uh, and those who already have uh, and those who are, uh, are the are the top of performing centers. Um, in terms of uh, how they've been um, registering their patients and performing improvement science, they are focusing on getting sustained remission greater than 75% and working on special studies. I think I, uh, I want to say thank you and hand off to Maddie. Is that right, Chris? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Maddie. We are, I'm working on unmuting you now. You should be unmuted. Um, take it away. Floor is yours. Thanks, Chris. Hello, my name is Maddie Hoovey, and I am a patient at Randall Children's Hospital and Seattle Children's Hospital. I am 18 years old and a member of the Patient Advisory Council. I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease at the age of 13. I had a road to diagnosis that would likely sound familiar to many of you. I lost weight, I was chronically fatigued, and I was constantly experiencing abdominal pain. I went into my first colonoscopy and endoscopy not knowing what the words Crohn's disease were. I was too young, too sick, and too exhausted to try to imagine the potential outcomes of the procedure. I just wanted to answer the question of what was causing these symptoms. I wanted to know how to fix the chaos this pain was causing in my life. My only hope going into the procedure was that the answers to my questions would be simple. I anticipated answers that were straightforward and solutions to my problems that were easy. I had no idea how my world was about to change. As I woke up from the procedure, I felt my mom next to me in the hospital bed. I was still sleepy and disoriented from the anesthesia, but I knew from the movement of her body that she was crying. My first reaction was confusion. 
why was my mom crying? Then I felt the dread in the pit of my stomach. What had my doctor found during my scope? So I asked the question, mommy, what's wrong with my tummy? Her words would change my world. Honey, you have Crohn's disease. I had no idea that these two words were just the beginning, that two words could hold so much weight, that two words could change my life. As I began this new chapter of my life with a diagnosis of Crohn's, I began to ask more questions. I found some were easier for other people to answer for me. Questions like, what is inflammatory bowel disease? What are my treatment options? And how often should I see my doctor? From there, however, my questions only grew in number and complexity. My new questions ranged from, will there ever be a cure? To how will this change my life? And why did this happen to me? How could 13-year-old me hold these questions alone? How could any person carry these kind of questions on their own? Holding questions in community is more empowering than pretending to have all the answers. I have learned that by asking questions, we learn to accept our reality and embrace our grief, to not fight it, deny it, or avoid it. By asking questions, I can identify my pain. Even without the answers, the questions are powerful because of their ability to name my grief. And sometimes answers to the hardest questions do not address the underlying reasons we are asking them. Instead, they attempt to solve the pain, to oversimplify the fundamental complexity of the situations and to treat grief like a problem to be fixed. Some people tried to hand me easy answers to my illness. These solutions oversimplified my situation. They shut down my grief and my growth. Answers like, something good will come from this. And every cloud has a silver lining. Or, you should be relieved. At least you don't have something worse. Regardless of whether these statements are true, they do nothing to address my current suffering. I learned to say, while these may be your answers, they are not mine right now. Rather than answers, the questions I have learned to ask teach me to live in and with my grief. And in time, when I began to find others asking the same questions, I was able to free myself from having to carry the questions alone. Others like the ICN community and the family I have found in the Patient Advisory Council. Community has been so essential for me for this reason, because I am not always going to feel strong. And when one person in a community does not feel strong enough to carry their suffering, another person is ready to step in and bear it with them. So do we rise together as a community, embrace the suffering, and ask the hard questions? Or do we allow the pain to take even more from us? I choose to ask the hard questions, to not shy away from naming the pain, because maybe if I can pull together the strength to ask those questions, it can show someone else that there is power in questioning their experience too. Maybe you have someone in your life who needs you to live in their grief with them. Because of communities like ICN, on the days I don't feel strong enough, I have friends who push on for me. My challenge for you is to ask the difficult questions. Embrace the grief. Keep questioning the pain. And to find others who want to stand with you while you do it. I challenge you to do it not just for your own liberation. Do it for the person who isn't strong enough today to do it for themselves. 
because there will always be that person. I encourage you to take advantage of the community you are surrounded by. Take advantage of opportunities to open discussions and ask questions. Wrestle with the hard issues together. Feel the pain deeply and continue supporting one another. Approach every issue with the humility to recognize that we will not always have the answers to every question. But remember that holding questions together can be even more powerful than pretending to have all the answers. Thank you. Maddie, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, for everybody who, uh, who, who just listened to that, um, Maddie gave the same, uh, the same talk, the same Ignite talk at our in-person community conference and uh, not a dry high in the house and a standing ovation. And so uh, if you want to, actually, if you want to see that video, it's, it's on, um, it is on our, our posted on our Facebook page. It's, it's as a part of the opening plenary video. Um, and uh, if you would like to share your story or know somebody who would, uh, feel, please, um, you know, feel free to put it in the, in the chat box um, and let us know and we can get back with you or, uh, or uh, follow up with us afterwards. I'll make sure to give my contact information, but um, we know how powerful those stories are and, and um, want to make sure that, that everybody gets a chance to share. Maddie, thank you so much. Um, so now it's my turn. Uh, I, I am going to talk uh, about the win-win. Uh, what I need when it's needed, or um, what is needed when it's needed. Um, it's strategies for how uh, how we are getting, uh, how we're getting, how we're building our engagement campaign. Things that we've learned recently, and what we what we hope to accomplish. Um, so first, I'm going to start out with a broad picture of what we're trying to achieve with patient and family engagement. We know that. Uh, in, in the healthcare system, there's people and information and technology. And what the real trick is, is getting the right information, knowledge, I I the right information into the right people's hands when they need it. So we want to make sure that the right information, knowledge, and know-how uh, is, is being shared with folks so they can get what they need when they need it. And so how do we, how do, we do that? Well, we're building a system to do that. And before I start, uh, before I talk about uh, a little more about that system, I want to I want to share with you an example of what that looks like, uh, what that looks like in practice. Um, so this is this is a real example. Um, last names are not shared, uh, but uh, of of how this system works and how every piece and every action can help lead to somebody getting a resource that they need. Um, so you know, on the left, you'll see Mark in green. So Mark is a doctor. He attended our spring 2016 community conference. After that, he heard how much patient and family engagement can help outcomes, can help clinical staff, uh, can, can provide a service both to, to, to patients and families and to the folks who are working to, to, help, to help them. Um, he asked Kathy to be their parent partner. Uh, and she said yes. And then she attended a community conference. Uh, she started the parent working group, who you'll hear from later, started attending their monthly calls, had a one-on-one -on -one with me. A one-on-one -on -one is a chance to, to talk and learn about, uh, you know, what, what you all have going on, what Improve Care Now has, has going on, and, and learn how you can get more involved. Um, in 2018, Kathy became the chair of, of one of the parent working group, uh, count, uh, council co-chair of one of the parent working group working committees. Um, and then this summer, uh, she said, I am getting all these great things from this, and I need to make sure that other folks that I know are getting involved too, or that they have the opportunity to get access to the same resources that I did. And so they had an event locally. Uh, she asked uh, a number of folks if they would sign up for a parent working group and to receive our circle e-newsletter. Molly is one of the parents who said yes. And a couple weeks later, we sent out a nutrition resource that the Patient Advisory Council is going to talk about later. Um, and after she received it, she reached back out to us and said, thank you so much for providing this information. My daughter is 11 and a half, loves to see and read about young girls with IBD. It makes her feel less alone. Um, 
And then we asked if we could share it with the community. And so the cycle started again. And, and my point in showing this is that it is, it is hard to think that uh, Mark in 2016 thought that him asking Kathy to be involved would lead to somebody they had never met, uh, getting access to a resource that would help uh, help improve outcomes and help improve their quality of life. And so um, each part of this system uh, led to, to uh, Molly and her daughter getting access to, to, that, to that resource. Um, we're trying to build and replicate this over and over and over again. Um, and why, you know, why are we doing that? Well, uh, I talked about the ick and the win-win, the information, knowledge, and know-how, know and what I need when, it, when it's needed. Um, we believe that when patients and families have access to information, knowledge, and know-how, uh, they, uh, they they're able to take greater ownership of their care. Quality of life improves, outcomes improve, uh, and uh, they start to share that information with everybody else. Uh, and so everybody starts to learn faster uh, and implement things, you know, learn things uh, if somebody in, in Pennsylvania is doing something wonderful, we want to make sure that some of the, the care center and the parents and, and patients and families in Seattle get it uh, as quickly as possible so that they can start to see the benefits from it. Um, you'll see the same, the same uh, chart that uh, Dr. Coletti shared, right? That, that we believe that patient and family engagement contributes to uh, improved outcomes. Um, so what, what does that mean for us? What are we trying to achieve? Well, um, we know in the ICN network at ICN care centers, there are about 60,000 patients or parents who could be engaged. They could be receiving this information. Um, right now, uh, only about 1,738 do or 1,738 um, do. Um, and we, so there's a, there's, a big, there's a big gap there. And we think that we can only uh, we can only achieve that gap. We can only go from reaching hundreds or thousands of patients and families to tens of thousands of patients and families if we build an integrated an integrated system. And we've started to we've started to see that work um, over the past year. Uh, we have through local and national partnerships started. I, I think. Uh, at one of the centers, one of the centers that first tested this uh, is having a watch party tonight, Cincinnati uh, Children's. Um, through local national partnerships, we saw 684 patients and families uh, sign up for the, the Circle community. Uh, we figured out, we think we figured out how to, how to get it to work. We went from uh, paper forms to, to folks using uh, tablets in care centers uh, with uh, nurses and doctors and uh, research coordinators asking, uh, asking patients and families if they want to join Circle. Um, and, and we learned that, you know, we couldn't have reached those 648 people on a national level without uh, coordinating with, uh, with local care centers. And so it's the local national partnership that's going to help us get from uh, 1,700 and some odd patients and families being connected to 20,000, 30,000, 50,000. Um, but we, we knew that we needed to learn more. Um, and so we, uh, last spring, started reaching out to patients and families. To, we wanted to know more about what, what resources are most important, how people like to access resources, what topics, um, and how do we all build a system uh, that connects and shares. Um, all of it is to make sure that all, all of you can get what I need when it's needed easier. That information, knowledge, and know-how are sharing free or uh, flowing freely um, between the different people who, who are a part of uh, the network. So one of the questions, I'm going to talk through a couple of the questions that we asked in that survey and some of the things that we learned from that. One, um, we asked people to think about how they or their child gets uh, information about managing their health and then reach each rate each of the following methods. Now, this is um, this is a busy slide. Uh, I, I, I acknowledge that. Um, I and would say that there are a couple of things that we took out of here that, that jumped out. Um, we looked at how people like to receive resources. I think you can see my like briefly see my cursor. 
or uh, faintly see my cursor right here in the center square uh, and then and then in the, in the far right and this was a little surprising to us we thought that that people would um, would choose to get resources from uh, printed resources from their care center. Um, the over overwhelmingly, uh, people said that they use online websites, blogs, uh, sometimes emails to get resources that are sent out. Um, but we also know that um, uh, when asked who they get information from, it's uh, physicians, nurses, and other clinical staff. Now. We we know we have to learn. We know we have to learn more about that. Um, for instance, figuring out what type of information patients and families like to get from clinical staff versus versus what type of information people go online to find on their own. Um, but we do think we do think we learned something there, and it's part of the reason why uh, why we are focusing on things like like uh, Circle, uh, where information and resources can be shared digitally. And in, uh, and, and in offering opportunities to connect online. Um, I know it may, may not seem groundbreaking that people like the internet, um, but, um, but we, we, think, we think we learned something, we think we learned something there. Um, a few of the other questions we asked, what kind of resources or in, or in, in what, what format? Um, I'm not going to read everything here, and, and, and certainly the slides will be available afterwards. Um, and we hope to, to release a, a, a more detailed summary of, of what we learned at some point, um, but send it out through Circle. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think we saw we saw uh, trends, and some of those trends uh, are things like general in general information, things they can people can learn. Uh, on their own and uh, and things that allow people to take action, right? So if you look at financial assistance for, for meds or scholarship opportunities uh, or medications, um, you know, those are things that people want to find and then to do something with. Um, and so it's not just getting information, it's getting information that helps inform things that they can do to improve, improve outcomes. Um, this is the magic wand question, right? Like short of a cure, what, what do you want? You could name anything, anything that, that you want. Um, again, uh, reinforces the need for uh, online things and in general information. It was, this was actually, um, we, one of the things that we were unsure about is when in somebody's timeline of diagnosis should they start getting resources when does it stop being overwhelming um, and we think that we learned um, uh, you know we learned that that people are asking for resources right away they want information and resources right away they're going to get them somewhere um, and being able to provide people with a trusted outlet uh, is uh, is important and again going back to the the actionable information right uh, a handbook that lists all the possible symptoms when, when to treat them at home versus when you need to go in uh, to the hospital or to, to the doctor, right? So information that helps people take action that can help improve, improve outcomes. Um, and then finally, things people wanted when, when or not finally, uh, things people wanted when they were first di diagnosed um, to follow up on the idea of like people getting more information. We had diet mentioned repeatedly. Um, I think one of the other things is, is we hear again and again is is um, people reaching out and, and looking for a community of support, uh, and then the uh, this is the, the last time somebody what you wanted information. Who did you go to for it? And something that stood out uh, to me uh, is that that Facebook uh, Facebook groups were mentioned a number of times, and I know. Uh, many of you listening probably are a part of patient or parent Facebook groups. Um, my guess is more parent Facebook groups than, than, than patient. <laughs> but uh, we know there are some, some good ones out there. Uh, my ask before I move on is if you know of any or have one that you consider to be um, useful or to give great information, uh, share it in the chat box so everybody else can join and see or email them to me. Um, 
we're interested in learning more about what how people connect places like Facebook and on social media um, to, to, to get information um, and how resources are shared through those through those methods. So like I said, we 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 want to we want to learn more, but all the information that we're getting is that people want to connect. They want to connect with information and resources. Uh, and we can um, and that and that they, they want information that's actionable and that we can help people. We can help people do that right now. If you're sitting next to somebody who is not um, who, who is not doesn't have access to this information. If you know somebody on one of your Facebook groups or or uh, you know through uh, personal relationships, um, we want to make sure they can get the information they have. And and going back to that first slide, uh, I want to talk about how two people, one person, two people can have a great impact. This is Ian and Michelle. Ian and Michelle, uh, one is a nurse and one is a research coordinator. Um, they were some of the first folks who uh, started using tablets to ask to get resources to people in clinic. And, um, and there are 139 uh, patients and families who now have access to resources who, who didn't um, before, uh, before Ian and Michelle asked them to sign up for, for, Circle, um, for the Circle E newsletter. Uh, we know for a fact that those out of those 139 people, there are people who are uh, reading uh, loop posts on the website. Uh, Mary chatted in the box a little bit about our, our loop uh, blog. We, we know that they are downloading resources like the Nutrition Toolkit we know that they're attending local and national events and that they're joining uh, the patient advisory council and parent working group and that they're they're out finding more information about research on our site we know those folks are doing that and so um, if you this is this is how we get from 100 and set or 1738 to 10,000 20,000 60,000 right it seems like a huge number but if you can think of these two folks over the course of you know between six months and a year um provided access to that many more people if you think about just the number of people on the call tonight um if if each of us were able to uh connect with you know even 10 people that's another uh almost 400 people who, who patients and families who have access to those resources so I, everybody can make an impact um and you can do it starting starting right now um, that's that's what we're learning. That's what we've learned over the past the past year. And there's a need out there for it. About 80% of people who are offered the opportunity to be involved uh, involved say say yes. So I've talked a lot about kind of uh, what what we've learned um, from a uh, kind of an, an academic standpoint, right? Like, um, but. How do we how do we turn this into action? And so we're going to hear some examples. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, 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 Kat and some folks uh, about uh, nutrition. Uh, we're going to hear from our friends in Kansas City. We're going to hear from the parent working group. As you're listening to these, think about something that you could implement immediately, even if it's small, um, and something that you can build long term um, and then how you how you or your care center or the organization you're a part of can help connect uh, patients and families to community uh, so they can have access to, to resources information knowledge know-how uh, to get uh, the win-win what I need when it's when it's needed with that um, I am going to pass the mic to Kat Catalina, and we're going to talk about nutrition and IBD and, um, and the new resources that they've developed. Can you hear me? This is Kat. We can. Yep. Uh, let me know I, uh, when you want me to advance the slides. Okie doke. Um, so uh, today, Missy or Maddie and I are going to do a quick presentation on one of our new resources, um, as well as on nutrition and IBD as a whole. Um, you were also supposed to have Missy as part of this presentation, but unfortunately she's not feeling well, uh, so she won't be joining us, but we're keeping her in our thoughts. Uh, next slide. 
Um, so a little outline of what we're going to be talking about. Um, we're going to have some patient stories about uh, experiences with different nutritional therapies, as well as why it's important to talk about nutrition in clinic and talking about nutrition with patients and parents generally. Uh, then we're going to discuss a little bit about patient developed resources. And then if we have time, uh, we'll do a little bit of Q&A. Next slide. So by the end of this session, here are some things that you should uh, take home with you. Uh, the first is to understand the importance of discussing nutrition with patients and their families. Um, so this is not only applicable to uh, the clinic setting, but also um, at home if you're a parent. Um, and then also, you know, understanding the importance of creating a multidisciplinary team that incorporates uh, dietitians and nutritionists, um, as well as uh, you should know where our resources are about nutrition and IBD, and you should be able to access them and use them. Next slide. Okay, so uh, first off, I'm going to let uh, Maddie take the wheel, introduce herself, and then uh, go ahead with, with what she wants to talk about. Hi, Next everyone. Um, Chris, we can advance slides. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about my experiences with uh, exclusive enteral nutrition, um, or EEN. Uh, I went on EEN for the first time following my diagnosis of Crohn's disease in January 2015. I was on tube feedings for about a year and a half, and I was able to achieve remission um, without the use of steroids and solely with uh, exclusive enteral nutrition. Um, so some pros for me through that experience were, one, the remission without steroids. Uh, for me and my family, exclusive enteral nutrition was a good fit, and I was willing to take that challenge on, and um, overall, I was able to, to avoid the use of steroids. Um, two, uh, the mucosal healing. Um, so exclusive enteral nutrition has demonstrated an ability to promote healing of the lining of the GI tract or the mucosal or mucosal, excuse me, mucosal healing. Um, so through that, I was able to gain a healthy body weight. Um, and then it also served as a really life-changing learning opportunity. Um, if I could go back, I wouldn't change my decision to choose NG tube feedings and EEN because I learned so much about my body through that process. Um, not to say that it was easy, which it was not, um, and I don't want to minimize the experience of other people uh, by, by saying that I wouldn't change my experience, but um, I did learn a lot about myself through that. And also, I learned to place my own NG tube, which is um, a huge benefit when doing tube feeding. I think having the control of placing your own tube and knowing where it is in your body um, gives a lot of empowerment to the patient. And also it's like the coolest party trick ever um, <laughs> the, for, um, for any peer group in general that I've ever showed it to. I've been very, very impressed. So um, again, I learned so much about my, how my body works through that process. Um, and then some of the cons, um, there is an emotional impact, and exclusive enteral nutrition and NG tube feedings aren't easy. Um, it's like any therapy, it requires commitment, and with that comes an emotional impact. Um, for me, it was worth the, the uh, commitment and emotional impact, and I was able to cope with that. Um, though I do know that it is not something every family can comply with. Um, because food is a huge part of our culture, and sharing food is a relational experience, so missing out on that can lead to feelings of isolation or loneliness. Um, for some families or patients, maintaining treatment compliance can be difficult. Um, any therapy requires dedication and compliance, and if this is an issue, it may be necessary to choose a different therapy. Um, we can move to the next slide. So from a patient perspective, uh, I have some suggestions for how to promote a healthy experience for patients using exclusive enteral nutrition. Um, this may seem obvious, but listen and communicate. Um, this is the patient's body and it's rather scary to have a tube placed and um, having a space where they can say what they want is important. Um, consider the emotional impact as discussed previously um, it can be lonely, and so making a decision with those uh, things in mind is important. Um, and finding relationships 
or finding ways to stay in relationship with food for me especially was important um, because I really craved the relational aspect of sharing food. And so to help with that, I started making food for other people. And through that experience, I was able to, to continue forming those relationships. And that's all I have. So I think I'll pass it on to Kat. Great. Thank you, Maddie. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can discuss nutrition in clinic as well as more broadly. Um, so for some context, I'm 22 now. I've been diagnosed with Crohn's for the last 12 years. Um, and I was managed entirely nutritionally with the specific carbohydrate diet and exclusive enteral nutrition for eight of those 12 years. Um, so I have a long history with nutritional therapy when it comes to treating my IBD. Um, and I really try to emphasize the importance of nu discussing nutrition in clinic. I think a lot of families come up to me, um, both as part of my patient advocacy work, as well as um, within my professional life and are concerned about nutrition. You know, it, it seems to make sense that a, a gastrointestinal condition would be somehow impacted by what you're eating. Um, so patients and families often have questions and I think discussing nutrition in clinic can be a good way of answering those questions in a way that's verified by data instead of um, potentially getting um, unverified information off the internet. I also think it's helpful for a sense of control. Um, I think IBD as well as um, all of the treatments that are often, the pharmaceutical treatments that are often prescribed for it uh, can be rather difficult to understand. Um, and so it can, having a nutritional plan or at least knowing a little bit about how nutrition can impact IBD um, can be helpful for patients and families um, to have a sense of control over their condition as well as understanding IBD as a whole. So if you talk about nutrition, you can talk about the microbiome, for example, and how that, that has a part to play in, in IBD. Um, I know that a lot of physicians and um, center staff might be apprehensive about discussing uh, nutrition with their patients. And so what I recommend for providers is to discuss a healthy diet broadly if you're not comfortable um, risk recommending one specific dietary therapy. Um, as well as to assess the patients for potential disordered eating patterns. Um, I've met a number of patients over the course of their um, IBD have developed disordered eating patterns, and I think that these can have a health impact on their to discuss with you. Um, and then really using those remission appointments where you don't have to discuss any uh, short-term um, strategies for putting uh, the disease into remission to talk about something like daily intake. You know, is your patient eating a balanced diet? Um, are they eating regular meals? And how does their eating schedule um, impact their quality of life during um, the period in which they're in remission? Next slide. Um, so I also wanted to talk quickly about nutrition and weight. So um, you'll see on the left there, uh, the first photo is six months before I was diagnosed with IBD at the age of 10, uh, and the second photo is two months afterwards. Um, and so you can see a big weight drop, uh, and I think especially the way that social media is impacting um, kids nowadays, it can be important to really make sure that we're talking about weight um, in a way that is healthy and that avoids weight stigma. Uh, I think many teenage IBD patients, female patients especially, are at a very sensitive age to discuss weight. Uh, and so weight gain especially can seem like a negative thing societally, um, whereas in IBD patients, a lot of times weight gain can be a positive sign of recovering from remission. Um, but even when I was flaring, I was told a lot, like, what is, how are you losing all this weight? You know, how are you getting so skinny? And I didn't have the guts to tell them that it's because I was going to the bathroom 10 times a day and that was my dietary strategy. But I think it just really emphasizes that we need to talk about weight gain and weight loss with IBD patients from a position of curiosity instead of a position of assigning positive and negative value. Um, so for example, some ways to talk about this are saying, you know, how do you feel about your body now? Um, after gaining or losing weight, or it looks like you gained some weight, how does that make you feel? Um, or if your patient has had 
a lot of uh, a long period of flair and has lost a lot of weight saying you know you gain some weight that's amazing and as establishing a positive association with weight gain when a patient is recovering from a flare um, and this can be especially important not only in the clinic but as well as in the house um, and making sure that patients want to see or know their weight when you're weighing them in clinic can be important because you never know who might get triggered by seeing that number on the scale. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to uh, run through Missy's slides quickly, but um, some of the pros in discussing nutrition generally, um, it can increase uh, awareness of nutrition in your population and how nutrition can um, impact IBD. It can also uh, help with treatment compliance because patients have a handle on every aspect of their condition, not necessarily just pharmaceutical interventions. And they can understand um, through nutrition how even their pharmaceutical um, treatments are actually impacting their disease. Uh, it also increases the comfort with um, patients discussing possible nutritional therapies with a provider instead of going rogue and doing it on their own. Um, and it, pos it fosters positive thinking about nutrition and body image in a social atmosphere that makes it often difficult to um, discuss these things in a positive way. It may also be frustrating at times to talk about nutrition generally. Uh, I know a lot of uh, families might hold on to treatments that aren't necessarily working for their child, um, but I think the pros uh, outweigh the cons, even if there's just four exclamation points or four uh, points for the pros and one for the con, uh, it's very clear that it, it's outweighing the cons dramatically. Next slide. Um, so here are some ways to uh, discuss positive conversations. Uh, the first is to talk with patients outside of clinic, whether that's in a patient education day um, or if you're referring them to a dietitian as part of their treatment. I think talking and about nutrition in general uh, throughout their lives is important, um, even in the home as well. Uh, next slide or next bullet point rather. Next. So I think it's, it's important to um, make sure that you're listening to the patient, uh, see what thoughts they have currently about nutrition and maybe what um, ideas they have about what they should or should not be doing. Um, and ask, like I said previously, about the patient's relationship with food, um, their food habits generally, what they're doing nutritionally for themselves, and feelings about nutritional therapies in general, whether that's simply exclusive entry nutrition at one extreme or just eating a balanced diet and incorporating more fruits and vegetables, for example. Uh, and we want to emphasize that this should be done routinely. I think it's, it's something important to do, especially when the patient is in remission and you have more time during those limited clinic appointments. Next slide. Next. Um, so here are some uh, other ways that it might be helpful to talk about nutrition. Uh, patients will be more comfortable asking questions in clinic. You make sure that you're opening communication, which can be especially important in a pediatric population. Um, it might also prevent against unhealthy eating habits or mental health issues uh, related to weight or eating. Uh, and it makes nutrition central for care, the team, as well as patients and families, and can be a great impetus for incorporating a more multidisciplinary team in your clinic. Uh, and it also may have unexpected benefits like um, educating your patients on nutrition, uh, as well as making them feel more confident uh, in who they are mentally, which uh, can have an impact on their physical health. Next slide. So we want to talk quickly about uh, some of our resources. Next. Um, the first is a nutrition and IBD toolkit uh, that Maddie and Missy uh, have charged in, have been charged in creating uh, that has been recently released to the ICN community. I think Chris mentioned it earlier. And like all of our resources, it's a patient developed resources that talks about personal stories with nutritional therapies, anything from total parental nutrition, special diets, nutritional shakes, and G tubes, um, as well as it provides uh, the expertise of registered dietitians that are part of the community. Uh, our audience is patients, families, and IBD care providers. Uh, and we also prevent data, present data on IBD and nutrition. Um, so we, to create this toolkit, we gathered the perspectives of uh, the 60 patients in the Patient Advisory Council, and we gathered all of that data and were able to create a summary of uh, some of the patients who are using different nutritional therapies. For example, on the bottom right, you can see, uh, it's kind of hard to read, but it's a 
a pie chart of uh, the percentages of patients using NG tubes. Next slide. Uh, and we also have stories. Um, I think these stories are incredibly beneficial for helping patients like uh, the testimonial that Chris gave uh, to feel less isolated. I think nutritional therapies especially can feel like you're the only one who can eat certain things or you're the only one who um, can't go out to dinner with your friends. And so it's, it's really helpful, I think, for patients uh, to hear other folks' stories uh, and as well as to get advice from them. So if that's anything from, you know, Maddie saying that um, putting her NG tube in was a cool party trick and maybe using that as a way to um, introduce it to your friends or just, you know, knowing how to do E and, and diversify the taste of the formula that you're drinking. Next slide. Um, and this is another toolkit that's currently in the final stages of production. Um, Maddie, do you want to talk about this one quickly? Um, so disordered eating is, as Kat mentioned, something that can affect an IBD patient's quality of life um, from nutritional experiences with therapies or um, just general day-to-day -day symptoms. Those, those are all things that can impact a, an IBD patient's relationship with food. Um, so we developed this resource using uh, PAC surveys. Um, so it's a patient-developed resource um, based on the information that PAC members gave us about their experiences with disordered eating patterns. Um, so we have a, a disordered eating Q&A um, with both patient and expert experiences um, and then an informative section on managing disordered eating habits and behaviors on a day-to-day -day, um, from a patient perspective. And the intended audience is parents and patients, as well as IBD care providers. We're hoping to reach the whole spectrum of the community with this toolkit. Next slide. Alrighty, so we want to open up, we have a couple of minutes, I think, for question and answer. So. If you have any questions about nutrition, about our resources, um, all of our resources are available on the Improved Care Now website under the Tools tab. Um, but yeah, any questions about nutrition generally, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we can address them. Um, Kat, I, I know it, it takes sometimes somebody jumping in to write the, to write the first question. Um, I, what, um, what are some common questions that you that you get or that people maybe think of uh, are there things that people ask at the at the in-person community conference uh that you remember or that you that stood out um that you could share yeah I think, go ahead that's good i think one of the one of the things that we often don't talk about is um stigma related to height um especially in male patients uh, given that the patient advisory council is mostly female, we have a tendency to not discuss that as much, but I think that that goes along with um, discussing stigma and weight. Um, also addressing height is important. Uh, I think that the term failure to thrive, which is often used to describe lack of growth in, pe in a pediatric population is kind of brutal. Um, and so making sure that, um, especially your male patients who tend to be a little bit shorter, um, given, you know, a lack of, of proper uh, nutritional status, um, have role models like Messi, for example, who are uh, pretty short men, <laughs> um, but who are very successful, can be valuable, um, as well as um, doing that in the home if you're a parent with, with a, a young male patient who perhaps is not um, to the same. Oh, sometimes that is present. Uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, Lisa Pitch put in the chat box, uh, how much input did you have when you were younger versus your parents about uh, what type of nutritional therapy you choose? Uh, so I think Maddie and I could both discuss this. Um, I really wasn't given much of a choice. I think it was uh, my parents who were scared about uh, what they had read about biologics. I don't think folks should be scared of biologics, but at that point there weren't as many options for IBD patients. And so um, my mom read about nutritional therapies in a book and decided to try me on exclusive annual nutrition, even though my physician actually hadn't even mentioned it. Um, so I didn't have much of a, 
of a choice in what type of nutritional therapy I was using. But uh, once I moved away for college, I actually decided to stop using nutritional therapy because my disease was flaring really badly. And at that point, I was I was given more of a of a choice. Um, and um, Maddie, do you want to talk about that quickly as well? I can share a little bit. Um, I had a an experience unlike CAD, I was given a lot of information. Um, it was a more of a discussion uh, between all of the members of my family about what we wanted to choose. And um, in the end, we decided that we felt we could take on nutritional therapy over um, using steroids or biologics. And um, I felt like I did have a wonderful uh, amount of information, both provided from uh, my physician, my GI doc, and my dietitian and um, and my parents so so a wide variety there um, so to talk about us uh, Lee Beck mentioned Jenny David's disordered eating and body image study so uh, Jenny David is a current uh, psychology fellow who is at Drexel who uh, was also a part of the patient advisory council um, and so she uh, is currently I think wrapping up a study on uh, disordered eating and body image. This isn't that study, uh, but we are talking to her when creating this toolkit um, to gather all of her expertise about disordered eating, but hopefully her study will uh, provide a lot more insight in us, a uh, randomized or a, a you know quantitative matter uh, regarding disordered eating and body image in uh, IBD populations. Um, I'm also seeing some questions about uh, how long did it take to get into remission with nutritional therapy. Um, I think that's independent based on you know the patient individually. For me, I, I you know when I was on exclusive enteral nutrition, I saw results in terms of symptom management uh, in the first two weeks of uh, a formula-based diet. Uh, but then I continued as is the recommendation with the formula diet for another six weeks. So um, that six week period put me into full remission, but um, I started seeing results within two weeks. Maddie, do you remember how quickly you could see? Yeah, I had a really results? similar experience. Um, symptom management wise, it was within three or four weeks. And then it took probably a couple months for me to main, or to achieve remission. Um, and I, I continued on exclusive ventral nutrition after that, but it was probably a couple of months. Right. And, and all of that obviously is, is individual to um, how, uh, how much inflammation uh, the child has as well as what their symptoms are. Um, okay. So another question. What are some things your parents said or did that helped you um, develop a positive body? Um, so I think uh, one of the things that, was really beneficial for me was um, being encouraged to throw out all of the clothes that didn't fit me anymore. I was um, holding on to a lot of the clothes from when I was flaring um, and that wasn't beneficial for my mental health once I got older and so I had a big clean out of my closet and, and tossed out all the clothes that didn't fit me so that when I went back into my closet every morning I didn't have to think about the fact that, you know, I was hoping that maybe one day I would, I would fit into those smaller clothes. And so that was, that was really beneficial for me as well as um, I think following body positive um, Instagram uh, folks is beneficial and it kind of um, calms down all of the highly uh, stylized photos that you see on those kinds of websites. Maddie, do you have any recommendations for, yeah. ways to develop positive body image? Um, for me, one of the biggest factors has been getting into an exercise routine. I think no matter how my body looks, feeling alive in my body has impacted my body image more than anything else. Um, finding activities that make me feel good about myself and feel like I am strong and capable and um, able to do things that I want to do um, make me feel proud of my body rather than looking at it at, from a more aesthetic point of view. Um, and so things like yoga or meditation or things that are more contemplative. Um, I found that running is really, that's what fits for me, but there's a lot of different options out there um, to get, to get patients feeling like 
their bodies are functioning again. That's great. Um, we also got a question in terms of exclusive undernutrition and eating. So when I was on exclusive ventral nutrition, I didn't eat, um, but that was, that was just the protocol that was recommended to me by my physician. Um, I know that and exclusive ventral nutrition can be followed differently based on different patients. Um, did you eat at all during your EEN, Natty? Yeah, I did. Um, I did between 200 and 300 calories of um, solid SCD, SCD food every night. Um, so that was, that was my only intake of solid food calories. Great. So um, that kind of protocols can vary um, somewhat between different centers. And if you have an interest in exclusive entry nutrition, we would encourage you to talk to your physician and see uh, what your options are, as well as how your specific uh, center is, is uh, recommending that patients follow EEN. Um, so uh, Paul also asked, what nutrition drinks did you use? Um, and why not try to drink them instead of using NG? So I actually did drink all of my EEN nutrition drinks. Um, I won't tell you which one I used because the formula has changed and it was no longer, or it wasn't nutritionally complete when I used it. Um, but I did, I did try to drink them. Um, I will say there are pros and cons to drinking them. Like I, I was able to maintain my energy levels during the day, um, but my breath did smell terrible. <laughs> um, and it was sometimes hard to get all of that uh, volume of fluid down. Um, Maddie, maybe you can talk about why you chose the NG tube? Yeah, um, for me, formula fatigue was a thing. I was managing some depression during that time, and it was hard to get myself to eat um, or drink, per se. Um, so using NG tubes as a way to get calories into my body was an important thing. I used um, Ensure the first time I went on it and on exclusive entry nutrition. And then the second time I used Kate Farms, which is a plant-based um, formula that um, was closer to, that was following a period of using this specific carbohydrate diet. So it was closer to what my microbiome was able to, to process. And it was less of a, an extreme jump than using a more processed um, formula such as Ensure or Boost. And I, I will say that it's important to mention that um, not all insurance companies will cover uh, drinking um, with EEN. They're actually more likely to cover uh, the, the shakes with exclusive enter nutrition if they're taken by NG tubes. So um, if you have a family that has uh, financial concerns with trying exclusive enter nutrition as it can um, eventually become kind of expensive, uh, potentially exploring the opportunity of using an NG tube can be beneficial from a financial point of view. Um, any other questions before we wrap up? Um, I think Chris might might encourage us to wrap up soon. So maybe one more question. Well, uh, while we see if anybody has anything they're, they're typing in, I want to question maybe the wrong word. Can, you're sharing a lot of the experiences that you had. And um, I want to acknowledge that there may be a tendency of folks to be like, oh, that worked for them, that'll work for us, and I'm gonna go do it. Um, I, if you hear something that you think would work from you, we certainly encourage everybody to like, go talk to your physician first, um, or talk to your, make sure you get the right fit for you. Um, I, I, there's another question, but I wanted to say that, I, Kat or Maddie, if you have any comment on, you know, on, on what I just said too, but uh, Jed has a question that, they just touch them. Yeah, I definitely would agree with you, Chris. I think it's every every treatment with IBD is individual to the individual patient. And so, you know, even there are some things that, that work for our bodies, it might not work for every patient. And we would encourage you to discuss these things with your physicians. Um, and then Paul or Jed asked, uh, was there a social impact to your EEN diet? Uh, I mean, for me, absolutely. It's a lot of our social events revolve around food. And so I had to pivot to making more of my social interaction with my friends um, around activities that didn't involve food. So for example, we would go to the movies um, because unless people were buying popcorn, um, it was uh, not as um, food centered or we would do things like um, go play a soccer game or something. And then I wouldn't go for the dinner afterwards. Um, I was also an only child. And so um, the impact of me not eating was, um, 
could be buffered uh, a lot by my parents, but if you have a family with a lot of kids, it might um, be difficult to separate one child if they're having a, a difficult time um, not consuming food while their siblings are. Um, Maddie, I bet you can talk about social yeah. impact. Yeah. yeah, so like Kat said, there's a huge um, social connection building relationships uh, in our culture surrounding food. Um, so I, I did find alternative ways to engage those situations. So like I said, I brought I brought food to school that I made, so I was contributing to that. Um, and then I also would, uh, during, at dinner time, I would either uh, warm my Ensure up or my, my um, Cape Farms, or I would freeze it into a popsicle, or I would put it in an ice cream maker, or, um, do something to the extent that it was different, um, which also helped with that. Um, I was feeling like I had some some variation there and also there are different flavors to those um drinks so finding like i don't know i for the longest time i uh, drank the chocolate flavors of those drinks before i realized that there was a strawberry and a vanilla and that was absolutely life-changing um so creating as much variation as i could um and adapting to those situations as was emotionally appropriate um was how i how i managed that and I think with that, we'll give it over to you, Chris. Great, thank you so much. Um, and uh, look out for the Nutrition Toolkit. Um, it's, it's on the website now, and I think it may be included in the follow-up email that, that we send to this. I wanna, I wanna hand it over to um, Jennifer and, and Megan from, from Children's Mercy in Kansas City. Uh, before I do, I wanna set the stage for this a little bit. Um, so we talked, Pat and, and Maddie uh, talked and presented about tools, things that they've used in their life. Um, and um, this presentation is going to be more focused on uh, things that, that you can do together or how you can build your team together uh, at your care center to uh, co-produce uh, tools and experiences and information and resources that can, that can help everybody, right? So how all of the members, uh, the uh, clinicians, patients, families, everybody can work together to develop the resources that uh, Catalina and, and Maddie were talking about um, and, to, and to make sure that the things being developed are uh, useful and, and effective. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Jennifer and Megan. Our um, presentation is a practical guide at taking co-production from a good idea to a great experience. I'm Megan, I am um, a social worker here at Children's Mercy. I am able to focus completely in the outpatient GI setting and part of my time is spent with the IBD team. And then for a little over a year now, I have been able to be the um, staff liaison between our PFAC and our clinical team. And I'm Jennifer, I'm um, a parent and I'm also the lead for the PFAC. So some quick objectives. Um, we are hoping that we can help with learning how uh, co-production has contributed to improve patient outcomes and better patient and family experiences here at Children's Mercy. Um, leave with practical ideas regarding increased co-production between the clinical team and our PFAC, and then identify a center priority area for patient and family co-production in your particular centers. Uh, next. So real quick about our Children's Mercy IBD clinic. Um, we have about 620 patients and um, are, uh, have approximately 80 to 100, 100 newly diagnosed um, IBD each year. Uh, we have about 21 attendings in our clinic, uh, six fellows. And then of those 21 attendings, 12 have some patients with IBD. Um, and then uh, we have two attendings that follow over 400 patients with IBD, and then also six of our fellows um, work with our um, patients with IBD. Our core QI group here is made up of two of our attendings, Dr. Bass and Dr. Goyle. We were able to get a nurse practitioner this past spring, which has been great. We have two coordinators, uh, myself. Um, we have a psychologist, Dr. Maddox, who's amazing and dedicated solely to our IBD program. Um, we have a registered dietitian, and then just a few months ago, we were able to add um, a pharmacist who currently splits time between um, IBD and rheumatology. 
Our PFAC um, has a pretty good history. Um, we joined the Improved Care Now, or Children's Mercy joined the Improved Care Now Network in 2011. And then the clinicians formed an IBD quality improvement team. And then a parent joined the team in 2012. Um, a couple of years later, we um, actually, uh, let me tell you a little bit. The parent joined the team at the request of the physician, of our lead physician. Um, and then we formed the PFAC back in 2014, and it was organized and led entirely by the, the parents, primarily that one lead parent. And then our PFAC members have been involved in local initiatives and national work with ICN over the past five years. Um, we have approximately anywhere from eight to 14 parents on the PFAC. Um, we have a formalized onboarding process. And some parents end up rotating off as their children age out of the Children's Mercy program. And some parents rotate off just as seasons of life change and things get busier and they need to change. So co-production is the result of very intentional planning of the following, communication and inclusion, collaboration that ultimately leads to co-production, and then sustainability or planning for the future. So throughout this presentation, we want um, you guys to think about these four different areas um, and consider what um, an initial focus could be at your center. So for example, um, regarding policy and procedures, how does a current policy or procedure impact patient and family experience? Um, regarding patient experience, um, as you design your clinic or inpatient flow, do you know if your center's priorities match the priorities of the patient and families? Um, education, how can you improve your patient and family education? Um, outcomes, what are you focused on improving at your center? Do you consistently track those results? Um, are there identified barriers or challenges to your, um, your improvement work? And then kind of thinking about what if patients and families could help? Because they can. And um, we've been able to um, kind of develop a process here at Children's Mercy where um, our PFAC is in highly integrated into all of these different areas um, here at Children's Mercy. So um, some lessons learned through communication and inclusion. We have our clinic team communication is very um, thoughtful. It's very deliberate. We have our QI meetings um, every other week. We have pre-visit planning and population management on the opposite weeks. Um, we're uh, staffing our new patients, newly diagnosed patients, um, at every Wednesday morning. We have new uh, patient appointments and um, our entire team, the, the core group that you um, saw earlier, uh, we're all there together and constantly in communication. And then we have very formal interactions with our PFAC as well. Um, we have, we were able to develop, um, the PFAC was able to develop a um, plan for um, having two patients at each uh, monthly QI meeting. And um, that, we originally, um, we had one, one parent who tried to make uh, the once a month QI meetings and just life gets in the way and was not always able to be there. And so um, a little over a year ago, the PFAC started with a, um, coming up with a plan that two patients, um, or excuse me, two parents Parent. attend, attend those. And then um, we developed a staff liaison um, kind of role for myself. That came actually out of uh, an annual lunch meeting. We have a lunch meeting every July where it's all of PFAC, all of our, that core QI group. Um, and then um, we, so we meet each year to kind of talk about things that we've accomplished and where we want to go in the future. And one of the things that we heard um, on the clinical side at the meeting last July was just having kind of a more formal plan of communication between our PFAC and our, our clinical team. Um, Dr. Bass, who is our lead, um, lead physician with IBD, um, had kind of been serving in that role, but very informally. And so um, we were able to make, um, create kind of this, this uh, liaison position um, that I was able to, um, I'm able to go to those PFAC meetings. Um, we meet, they meet every other month. 
um, and just make sure that there's uh, good communication from the clinic side and that the, the clinic side understands um, where, the, where the parents are, are coming from. There's lots of emails. And then I think one of the um, pieces that makes um, our hospital pretty unique um, is the institutional support that we have. And I'll actually talk about that on the next slide. Um, and then we have some informal communication, um, texting and emails between um, Jennifer and I um, text quite a bit and email quite a bit. And it is always very um, specific. It's only specific to PFAC things. There's never any patient or anything like that discussed. Obviously, um, it's very, it's informal, but it's also very um, formalized to our PFAC um, relationship. Um, next slide. So these are, uh, so regarding collaboration, our hospital, we actually have a patient and family engagement team. Um, so these are two or three uh, professionals here and their role is to kind of oversee our patient and family, family advisory committees. We have several, I can't, I should have had that ready. I think we're up to 14 now. 14, 14 PFAC. PFAC. Um, and so they oversee that, and then they're constantly bringing in that patient um, and the, the family, the parent voice um, to Children's Mercy. So, and that's at an institutional level, an administrative level, which um, I think is very helpful for our, um, for our, our PFAC to have such an integral part into the QI team. Um, they provide PFAC leader training. Um, and then they also are great with being able to help communication gaps between um, the PFAC and the institution, so, or our clinical team. So um, PFAC comes to us with great ideas and our doctors are on board. And then sometimes it just kind of fits because do we need to talk to marketing? Do we need to talk to um, IT? And so we can reach out to those patient and family engagement team uh, members and see kind of where they can direct us or if they can take the wheel and and use their connections here at our institution. So um, another aspect of our collaboration is that it is at this point with our clinical team, it's just um, kind of common practice for us to always, for our clinic team to always ask, what would the PFAC think? So we, um, in developing a flu shot letter, we send that out to our uh, to our team lead to disperse amongst PFAC um, to get parent input. Um, we talked about a couple years ago discontinuing infusion uh, pre-medications. Um, Jennifer will talk about that on the next slide, but that um, we had a lot of um, input from our lead PFAC at the time. And then um, at our PFAC meetings um, coming up, they come up with great ideas and then are constantly um, asking how can the clinical team reasonably do this? So um, at this point for us, the collaboration is just kind of um, a part of who we are and um, what what our team, are, what makes up our team. So one of the questions, one of the things that our, our PFAC does when we're considering what we're bringing to the QI team and um, whether or not the, the ideas that we're bringing are gonna have a large scale impact um, we're not looking to impact just a few of our IBD patients, but we're looking to impact the whole of our patient population as much as possible. And is it going to get support from the clinical side and also from the institutional side? Um, we can come up with some great ideas, but sometimes they don't, they don't fit. And then, the, then also the question is whether or not it fits in QI, um, quality improvement. Um, we partner to some degree with CCF just in the sense that they provide a lot of educational opportunities and networking opportunities and even support opportunities. We don't feel like that we need to reinvent that. That's already being done so well. And so we're primarily focused on QI. Are we improving the outcomes of our, of our patients? Are we improving the experience of our patients and families? And also, what kind of burden is this going to bring to the team? Is this going to be... Um, um, a lot of work, is it going to be little work, high impact, um, there's the impact effort scale um, that some people use, and is this going to help? Will we help or are we just going to create more work, which definitely is not our goal. Um, this is an interesting um, idea of how PFAC, or how a communication exchange has happened in our PFAC. 
So you see the first little bubble. Um, this was about dropping the pre-meds um, from infusions. Um, and so this went out from our lead physician to our lead parent. And so she's like, as a parent, would you be okay with an explanation from infusion nurse regarding this change? Or would you want an explanation in a different manner? What questions would you have? Any issues we need to consider? And so Chris, go ahead and click again and bring up the next few bubbles, just kind of go through. Um, all of this communication happened in roughly, I think it was about a 24-hour period. And what happened is that we were able, by a back and forth between the IBD um, coordinator nurse and the lead physician and the lead parent, um, come up with a new plan and a new uh, way of um, communicating with parents, but also find, finding out whether or not it would be okay with parents if how the communication about dropping the um, pre-medication meds was delivered. And it just basically came down to how it would be okay if the nurse did it. And it was interesting because our lead PFAC went in, I think, a month or two after this whole conversation took place. and um, that's what she experienced. The nurse came in and said, hey, I wanted to let you know that we've changed how we do some things and we've talked with um, our PFAC and this is kind of how they recommended that we do it. And she didn't realize that she was talking to the person that, to one of the people that was involved in the whole discussion. Um, this is another example of how our clinic, um, how PFAC kind of um, had a huge impact in um, some education. So. Um, this is our current, um, it's our current DPART summary that all of our patient families receive. Um, but several years ago, our, um, our parent group uh, had identified a gap in care um, at our clinic. Um, parents felt that they, were with, uh, that they were leaving clinic without a clear plan. So there wouldn't be much, um, much information uh, on, some, on the DPART summary when they left and were having um, just some confusion over, over next steps. And so our parents developed an example of what they um, would like to see from the clinic. They developed um, a, a, lar a longer version of what you're seeing on the screen now. Um, they sent it to our QI team. Um, we had a provider that uh, was willing to try it out. And what she found out was that it uh, added a lot of time. I think like an extra 20 minutes to fill it all out. And um, obviously that adding that much time to a clinic visit is not an option. And so came back to PFAC and just um, kind of asked how it can be condensed while keeping um, the same content. And so several changes uh, were made and um, this was created. And at this point, it is, it is standard practice. Every single one of our um, providers um, who work uh, with our IBD patients um, use this and it's now part of our um, the electronic medical record here um, in the patient uh, chart so um, what was needed from this was two things we we needed um, we had to have a, a doctor that was open to change um, just to changing and and hearing this idea and that's that's what dr. bass does for us um, and then we needed a PFAC that was op that was able to parents that we're able to identify um, a gap in care and feel comfortable to bring that to our attention. Um, it, this was kind of a longer process. Um, it took, like I said, it took a lot of kind of communication back and forth, but it ultimately, um, this, this quote here, um, it changed how I practice. That's um, a direct quote from, our, from Dr. Bass. And um, I mean, she talks about this kind of collaboration, um, co-production success, frequently when um, talking to our PFAC, about our PFAC. One of the things that we discovered um, as I came onto the PFAC, I've been on the PFAC for about three years. Um, we had an awesome, awesome lead parent, but she was also feeling, um, like we talked about how seasons change and life changes, um, that there was a lot of burden on her. And so we needed to come up with a plan for um, leadership transition and to formalize our PFAC um, processes and some of just how we operate in order to make this sustainable. And so one of the things we did was we took a, almost uh, probably several months to almost a year working on our mission, our vision, 
um, our key driver diagram, which you'll see in a little bit. And we came up with um, some role definitions and some responsibilities for the roles. Like for me, I'm the PFAC leader, so I'm the primary contact person that the clinical team will contact. And then, um, then I disseminate information via email and other um, electronic means and so forth to our PFAC members um, and then organizing the group and so forth. We also have an official onboarding process where we, um, as we bring people on board, they have to go through the Children's Mercy Volunteer process, but there's also a process that they go on board with us. Part of that process also includes learning about ICN and how we relate to ICN and use the um, ICN metrics and so forth to measure our quality improvement and how we're doing. Um, so all of that has enabled us to look for the future and to be able to continue this great partnership that was started with one parent several years ago. This is a slide that kind of shows a lot of the products of our co-production. And I can't remember, Megan, if I was doing this one or if you were. I'll let you take care of it. But, um, <laughs> sure. Um, these are just a few of the things that have come out of our, um, our work with um, the clinical team, our PFAC work. One of them is a flare algorithm. We have parents that were wondering, when do I need to call the doctor? When do I don't need to call? You know, when can I just send a me message through the portal? When do I need to go to the hospital? And so we, alongside with the clinical team, we de developed a flare algorithm so that it was kind of like one of these things where if this is happening, then you need to do, do this. If this is happening, then you need to do this. And a lot of our um, parents have found that extremely helpful. Um, something else that we did was an IBD school letter. This goes out to, um, with patients so that they can take it to their schools. It's got information for school personnel about how to help IBD patients at school. One of the things that the PFAC did in that letter uh, was in the we, first of all, we reviewed it for information. But recently, most recently, we added um, a little piece in there along with Dr. Maddox regarding trauma-informed care because we've discussed about how IBD testing, IBD treatment can be very traumatic, especially for younger children, but also for teenagers. We developed the family handbook. Um, we've had, um, we've reviewed the young adult clinics, transition and transfer discussions. Um, the PFAC's written a letter to families after a new diagnosis so that they know who we are and so that they know how to contact us. One of the bigger projects that's been going on at our, at our um, center is the My Care app. This is a, a phone application that um, integrates um, symptom management, medication adherence. Um, it's gamified so that um, patients are given rewards for adhering to medications and to tracking the symptoms. Eventually, we hope that this can be um, directly connected with the um, uh, the EMR, the uh, electronic medical records, so that a physician can pull up um, a patient's um, kind of history of symptoms. Um, we found that this is going to be probably pretty helpful, especially for teenagers. Um, I don't know about you all, but my teen um, kind of forgets um, when she's been feeling bad and when she's been feeling good and what's connected to it. So they can track a lot of things with this um, app that will give the provider a lot more data and possibly improve their treatment. The other thing that we've been working on is a communication tool. Um, we've had some parents who have struggled with um, how they actually feel about the treatment plan. And, um, and so one of the things that we're working on now is developing a feedback tool so that when parents get a change in the treatment plan or something added to their treatment plan, but they're not sure about it, they can, um, this is a, essentially an electronic tool that'll feed back to the clinic to let them know, hey, I'm on board with this, I'm good. Or they can say, I'm okay with this, but I might need some help. Or they can say, I don't know about this, can you please follow up with me? And the last would be that they would say that, no, I don't think I can do this. Depending on how they answer in that communication tool, the clinic will automatically follow up with them within a certain amount of time period. 
obviously if the answer that is, hey, I'm not comfortable with this at all, they'll get a follow-up within a day or two. Um, and so it's just a way to help increase communication and increase care and hopefully um, educate parents better about the treatment plans that they're receiving, but also um, hopefully improve outcomes by catching things early on before um, things get out of hand. And of course, we already talked about our DPART summary. And then we also have uh, direct mail and listserv list communication with families. Um, our clinic is working on sending out newsletters with educational pieces and other information. Um, and some inspiring stories, too, that, that has helped. So, and the MyCare app is, is pretty yeah. fascinating because it's a huge project. It's been, I think, in development for probably the last two and a half years. Um, that has the potential to kind of go across hospital our hospital system, um, but it really it literally started in um, a basement meeting room here to meet here at our hospital um, with this group with our group of, of parents um, and it has morphed into um, a huge project um, involving our philanthropy philanthropy department and um, just a lot of innovation uh, team. Yeah, um, it's been a really fascinating and cool um, experience that that started with our PFACs. And they hope at some point um, we have a sense of kind of ownership of it in the IBD clinic. But the dream of the hospital is for this to go system wide. Um, um, Oncology is looking at it, and several other um, departments and specialties are interested in it as well. One thing I forgot to mention is that the MyCare app also includes a mental health piece so that folks can, um, so that patients can track where they are mentally. Uh, we are working very, very hard um, in that area and really are starting to recognize um, the mental health aspect, especially of IBD and other chronic diseases. And so we're really excited about that app um, being able to go into production. It's actually in beta testing right now. And so we're pretty happy about that. And again, it's something that um, it's, it's possible that it's going to go system wide. And as a parent, I'm thinking, wow, the work that we started in that little basement room with, I think, pizza that night um, is has the possibility of impacting not only the 620 IBD patients that Children's Emergency serves, but a whole lot more as it expands to different specialties. I think we can go to the next one now. And so just reiterating what uh, I think Chris said earlier, just I'm um, thinking you know, by next Tuesday, um, what are some changes or some place, some um, ways that, that you can, what you can identify at your institution um, to kind of start looping in the parent voice um, from a QI, with a QI perspective. And I think the next few slides are just, yeah, questions and then we are finished. Yeah. My question, uh, maybe a quick piece of advice. If there is somebody on the call who is a, a clinical staff member who wants to get a parent and parent or patient involved, or a patient or a parent who would like to get involved, like how do you recommend making that first connect? Like what is the first thing they should say? Do they just start like asking people? Um, the very first, uh, they're sitting here and they're like, that all sounds great, um, but I don't know how to get started. Yeah, so I think um, what Dr. Bass has shared is she, um, she knew a, Jamie Hicks was our parent, our lead parent before Jennifer, um, and she um, was she was Jamie the the doctor for um, Jamie's child, and uh, she Jamie had some qualities that I mean it was a very it's very deliberate and very thoughtful um, person to identify. You definitely want the the right person, and so Jamie um, came with lots of questions, um, lots of detail, and um, it was right when, you know, we were kind of starting um, our journey with ICN, and so um, she identified that person, um, Jamie, and it, I think the key is, you know, we're talking about very large projects, 
but it's to start out very small and very deliberate. And what is one area that you can focus on and then from there build out? Because what we're sharing is five, six years of, of, of co-production. And so just being very deliberate in who that parent partner could be um, and then starting very small. And I think from the parent side of things, um, one of the things is that um, okay, Megan mentioned that Jamie was, you know, very, asked a lot of questions and was very, um, I guess, detail focused and so forth. Um, Dr. Bass shares stories about Jamie showing up with her three ring binder um, to mm -hmm. appointments and stuff in the hospital. So, but from a parent side of things, I think it's one of those where it's it's difficult sometimes to approach providers, but I have um, really started to to figure out that the the providers at Children's Mercy are very open to parent uh, input. Um, now I have met with some parents who have said that um, at their at their place, and I don't think it was an ICN. I think it was with another group of parents I was meeting with at one point that said that. Their, their clinicians would never want a parent to sit in or a family member to, to sit in. And um, it reminds me of a saying that someone once told me that slow is fast and fast is slow. Um, you can, uh, clinicians and, and clinics can go ahead and go forward with all their policies and procedures without parent input, but then they might end up having to revise a lot of those policies and procedures and keep revising and keep revising. And I, I liken it to quality assurance testing in the, in the, in the IT world where um, it's easier to test something in a test environment with, with parents on a PFAC um, than it is to rewrite the code after it's already out into production. And so if, if, um, if clinicians and providers can consider that, um, it might save a lot of headaches and a lot of work in the long run. And I think um, too, um, and before I saw, I see Jed's question here, but I think too, at in, um, if you're at an institution um, and they have P, the, the PFAC um, as part of their, the hospital, reaching out to whomever is in charge of those PFACs and seeing if how you could get one started. Um, they will have lots of resources as well. Thank you so much. I, this is fantastic and groundbreaking work, and, and I'm excited that we're going to get to learn uh, together um, and continue to do this work together in the future. With that, I, I want to hand it over to, to Jill. Um, Jill. Jill is co-chair of the uh, Parent Working Group and of her local, uh, uh, local patient parent I don't know what PPAT stands for. <laughs> Pair patient advisory team. <laughs> Jill, Jill, fantastic and wonderful. And the rest of the time, except for like 30 or 45 seconds at the end is, is for <clears throat> Jill, take it away. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us here this evening. Um, wanted to do a special shout out. I know a lot of folks are coming from school or home or work or what have you. Um, but it really means a lot to us to have you part of this community and be um, members of this community virtually this evening. So I did want to thank you all for that. Welcome to the party, and we're glad that you joined us. So we did want to acknowledge Dr. Coletti um, in his transitioning out of ICN as of June of 2020. We really, as the Parent Working Group, wanted to thank Dr. Coletti for his unyielding commitment to improving, uh, improving the care of children and adolescents with inflammatory bowel disease. Um, we did want to mention that um, parents will have a voice in the selection of our next two leaders. We'll actually have two individuals taking over for Dr. Coletti. Um, and we wanted to emphasize that we need the parent voice to be um, active participants, stakeholders in this process, and there will be mechanisms for that to happen. Um, but we wanted to sincerely thank Dr. Coletti and uh, wish him well in his next chapter. Next slide, please. And then we wanted to take a moment to congratulate Dr. Margolis. Um, he was recently elected, uh, just recently, I believe this morning, uh, we got the news for the National Academy of Medicine. This is an incredibly prestigious honor and it's such a uh, privilege to be able to you know, work with Dr. Margolis through Improved Care Now. 
Dr. Margolis is the co-director of the James Anderson uh, for Healthcare Systems at Cincinnati Children's. He's the executive scientific director with Improved Care Now. Um, and again, the parent working group just wanted to congratulate Dr. Margolis on this very um, incredible achievement. So very, very excited for that. Next slide, please. And then our final announcement is that uh, the parent working group leadership is experiencing a transition. We wanted to thank um, our, my, my co-lead, Deborah Ostegi, who is coming to the end of her tenure as the parent co-lead for the parent working group. And if you've ever met Deb, you know, you, you probably haven't met a friendlier, warm person. Um, her incredible leadership, dedication, and loyalty to improve care now has been exemplary and um, with, it's with heartfelt thanks um, that we wish Deb well as she transitions out of this role. Um, she has agreed to stay on as a mentor to the parent working group after the completion of her tenure. Uh, but we did want to acknowledge and thank Deb for all of her hard work um, and dedication to improve care now. Next slide, please. So um, right now, the parent working group is in a period of transition. We have to think about things, uh, a new way of thinking. Historically, um, we've had, you know, have enjoyed many parents being able to attend the national conferences. And during those times, it's an incredible opportunity to network and learn from one another and really work off that synergy and energy that happens at those community conferences. Because we've had the funding, uh, we used to be funded through CCF, um, and they had opted to, um, they, they had offered that funding for a period of time, and unfortunately that funding has ended. And as a result of that, there's been a gap in really being able to provide resources to get um, as many parents as we used to have to the conferences. With that in mind, the parent working group has to think differently and adapt to the changing environment. These are the realities that fewer parents are able to attend the community conferences. So we really need to think about how do we support one another? How do we continue with this mentoring? How do we have a vehicle for the voice virtually? And so these are the, the new challenges associated with the parent working group, but we're excited by the opportunities. Um, I think one of the things that makes us feel a little bit happier is that when Chris was looking at the data, um, people feel very comfortable in this format in terms of being able to communicate via online. Um, so we need to be innovative in our thinking so that we don't lose that momentum and that synergy and sense of support that we've had in the past. Um, so in terms of victories, uh, the parent working group is comprised of incredibly talented and dedicated caregivers. And I think you just heard an example of that with the folks from Children's Mercy, that there's some incredibly innovative um, groundbreaking work that's being done throughout the country and, and in fact internationally with parents as stakeholders being involved in this process. Um, and we'd like to help enhance and continue that throughout, throughout our tenure here. So at our fall community conference, we had about 18 parents from across the country. We engaged in really innovative and interesting discussions. We had lots of sharing of ideas and we did an exercise um, with the following kind of questions. Who or what is your why? Um, what are your care center's goals? What are the exciting things that are happening at your care center? What are two things that you wanna learn and two things that you wanna teach? So we can forward, Chris. Another one? Okay. So when we asked the question, who or what was your why? Why were they at the conference? Um, these were some of the answers. To imp improve care for our children, to share seamlessly and steal shamelessly, to increase engagement at the local level, to impact change without reinventing the wheel, to grow personally, to present at the conference, and um, finally a physician invited them. Next slide. What are your care center's goals? This was actually a really interesting question because 50% of the folks who were there weren't really sure what the care center goals were. And we see that as a gap and an opportunity to really engage in those local centers to be really an integrated part of that team. So it, it really presented an opportunity moving forward from the, the conference to really engage with your local centers to figure out what it is that they're trying to achieve. Um, some folks talked about the improved remission rates, again, looking at QI, increased parent and patient involvement, establish parent support group, develop educational events, learn to help the center develop goals for a parent group, 
a transition booklet, and getting ideas for improving communication with centers locally. So those were some of the, the uh, local goals that they had. Next slide, please. So what's happening at your center? And I found this to be the most striking part of it. There's some incredible work that's being done throughout all of our local centers. And you know, wherever you are in that process, um, really focus on those little victories. So some of the things that are happening at other centers are participating in the QI process, strategy and population management meetings, um, meeting meet monthly or quarterly, um, having parent meetings, regular social events for families, educational events, fundraisers, increasing engagement in the community involvement, mentoring programs, art therapy for patients during parent meetings, moving IBD clinics off campus due to California insurance rules about infusions, um, grant funded programs, phone apps, web based tools, IBD handbook and revisions. Um, again, this is really innovative work that's being done and um, I think it was really nice to be part of the community and be able to hear all of the excitement of what's being done and what could possibly be done um, in terms of opportunities at local centers. Next slide, please. So two things you wanna learn, everything, how to increase engagement, how to start a learning network, how others support transition from peds to adults, how other centers manage infusions, um, especially you know, at home versus at clinics, how to support and involve si siblings. And then finally, next slide, please. Um, two things that I can teach, how to onboard parents and patients, how to have a voice, how to spread word about the care center, and how to start a support group. So there was lots of opportunities for sharing. Next slide, please. So I think the takeaway is that Rome was not built in a day, that your, uh, your efforts will bear fruit, and the other big takeaway was put the oxygen mask on yourself first. Um, it allows you to care for the others and you have to care for your own emotional and physical um, uh, self before you can take care of others. And I think as parents, oftentimes we put our needs behind our children's. I think the thing that the biggest takeaway um, from the community conference is that we have some wonderful opportunities for the future. One of the things that we identified is the ICN website um, it's hard to navigate and not particularly user-friendly. One of our goals for the future is to be able to harness the energy and the collective creativity of our parent working group in a way that is meaningful and easy for others to access. Um, the other thing that we were thinking about is creating toolkits um, that can be used throughout the network. Um, and those are opportunities for allowing other parents to be able to take what people have learned and then implement it in their local centers. So opportunities and themes for improvement. One of the things that because we're working virtually, um, we wanted to be able to develop these relationships among other centers. So developing a list of parent experts, coaches to help other care centers. We wanna be able to create our own resource network within the parent working group that other centers can go to. So say for example, you're interested in um, perhaps starting a communication tool. Well, then maybe you would reach out to Mercy Hospital, Mercy's Children, Children's Mercy, just to be able to get that information. Being able to create this network in a usable, friendly way um, to allow us to be coaches for one another is one of our bigger goals. Um, we, we did a voting exercise just to figure out, you know, what are the topic areas that people felt particularly strong about? Um, and you'll see down below, you know, the, the numbers of votes. Um, the top one was how to put on educational events, um, onboarding new parents to advisory teams. The other things mentioned were fundraising, social gatherings, um, IBD handbooks, um, toolkits, etc. These are opportunities that we have experts within the parent working group and we want to harness that energy and harness that collective knowledge so that we can use it in um, very practical ways. And so as one of the goals for the future of the parent working group is to be able to, um, again, kind of collaborate that information in a usable way that other people can really benefit from. So across the miles, next slide please. Um, across the miles, it's the shared sense of purpose, it's the dedication and friendships of the parent working group that will really allow us to grow and be successful. 
Um, these are just some samples of pictures from different community conferences, but it's folks coming from all over, all, all areas of the country, bringing their passion and the expertise to the parent working group, really for the common purpose of improving care for our kids. Our shared purpose is really to improve care. And I think, you know, this represents really the essence of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, when we talk about who our why is, there was an inspirational talk by um, Isaac Sharanga when he talks about who's your why. This really, I think, encapsulates what it is that we're trying to do. Who motivates you to do what you do? When you look around, and look at the people in your life. Who can you say because of you, I will do more, be more, and become more? Um, the parent working group is inspired by not only our parent, by our patients. Um, we're inspired by each other because this is a tough road. None of us chose, um, but the if we can take our collective energy and our enthusiasm, there's incredible things that can happen as a result of that. And I think Chris is taking over the next part. So thank you. Uh, Jill, thank thank you so much. All right, so we are already at 8:04, and so I'm gonna I'm just gonna click through a bunch of slides. Uh, lots of different things that everybody can do to participate. You can go on the website, you can sign up for Circle. If you're not signed up for Circle, you should. If you don't know so, if you know somebody who isn't, you should ask them. Um, and uh, if you are somebody who would like to try doing that at or in a clinic, um, like we said, we about 80 percent total of the people who, who are asked or of the families who are asked have somebody sign up um, to reach out. You should reach out to me. We should talk about it because um, we'd love to love to learn from that and um, and be able to, to help facilitate that process. Um, you can go sign up for uh, read the loop blog or share your story there. Um, it is uh, I think last year or the year before was uh, voted one of the top 10 uh, blogs on uh, IBD um, and our uh, communications team uh, does a wonderful job. Make sure all stories get up there. It's fantastic. Um, all lots of different ways to get involved. You can find videos and tools and all of those things on our website. Uh, the last thing I want to do is uh, there is a survey that I just put in the chat box and that we're going to email out to you. My last ask is for you all to fill that out. I know every time you go to a training, somebody probably asks you to fill out a survey and talk about how it went. Um, there are things over the past year and a half or two, oh, two years that we've gotten from those surveys and that we've, we've used to adjust these presentation or this, this event. Um, when this event started out, it was four hours long. Uh, and presentations were about an hour long each. Um, it's only about two hours now, and presentations don't go over a half an hour. That's because of feedback that we got from, from people who, who were watching, um, you know, uh, spending more time talking about specific resources that people can use right now, that type of stuff. So please, please, please fill out the survey. Um, and I don't know, finally, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate everybody's time. I appreciate everybody who helped uh, behind the scenes, uh, uh, Sydney and Kelsey and, and um, Melissa and Mary, uh, and the whole group of folks who are tuned in uh, together from, from Cincinnati Children's. They did an in-person watch party for this. Um, it's, I think, their fourth one, um, and so uh, excited to, to have them on. I am going to put my email address in the chat box. Otherwise, um, keep an eye out for a follow-up email. Um, you will get it. And this video, if you have friends, relatives, uh, if you just like really like this video and want to share it with everybody you know, um, all of those things will be available through our website soon. Um, thank you all so much. Have a great rest of your night. Um, thanks for coming. Bye.